So what we're reading there is pretty much the start of the gospel really being taken to uh, to the world. I mean, uh, obviously it had been spread, spread to some regions, but then through the Apostle Paul and, you know, Paul and Barnabas were separated there to go preach uh, the gospel, which was the Great Commission from the very beginning. Jesus wanted us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And uh, it's funny, I preached last night in Iola on this, uh, from this text, and I'm not going to re-preach the sermon that I preached, but uh, the idea was about, uh, it was an introduction into just evangelizing Latin America. And I went into some of the history about uh, the colonization of the Americas and, and just the bloodbath of like the Spanish conquistadors and all this stuff that, that happened. And, and, uh, and, I, and I mentioned how most of the world today, I, sh- I shouldn't say most of the world, but uh, particularly like atheists and those who hate religion will tell you like, You know, we should have just left the Native Americans alone and we should have, uh, you know, not, you know, just let them be, let them have their own religion. Now, I don't like the way that that the gospel was spread because it wasn't the real gospel. Right. We understand that Catholicism that was brought in from uh, European countries, Spain, Portugal, whatever, uh, all these came and, you know, they were by force. Uh, you know, making them uh, be by the sword to become a Christian nation and a so-called Christian nation. And, uh, and so none of that's good, obviously. But the reasoning of the non-believers and the, you know, atheists and what have you that say, oh, man, you should just leave people alone. Let them believe what they want to believe. Well, we know as Christians that that's not true. We've got a job to take the gospel into the world, obviously not by sword. Obviously, there's a way to do that, which is what I preached about yesterday. Uh, and really, if you go to this text here that we just read, that, that Brother Justin just read, by the way, long text. Thank you for uh, paying attention. <laughs> but uh, uh, what we see is that here's pretty much the way that evangelism is done. They were, you know, there was a certain men that were called and they were sent out and they went out and they got anybody that, w- that could come along with them to help them. And they went out and they preached the gospel to whoever would listen and they did it regularly okay and this was all this was how the church how the gospel was spread daily in the temple in every house they cease not to preach uh preach the lord so here's what it says in uh romans 10 uh, most of you have have this memorized i'm sure but romans 10 it says uh and how uh and how shall they of course it says whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher. So obviously we've, we've got a job to take the gospel to everybody. And so the whole world, and praise the Lord, the, world, the gospel has been taken to the whole world. And as I've mentioned in previous lessons, apparently one out of three people in the world claim to be Christian. And with the growing population of Islam and others, uh, you know, that's, that's huge that one out of three people claims to be a Christian. In the United States, even more than that. And we know that because we knock on doors regularly and, and, you know, if you're just getting into soul winning for the first time and knocking on doors and, and trying to give the gospel to people, you might have thought that in the United States, you're going to go out and knock on doors and like every other door is going to be some God-hating atheist that tells you to get lost or whatever. Maybe that's your impression, but it's not that way. I mean, the majority of people believe in God. They believe in the Bible and they just say something like, yeah, I just don't go to church or I haven't been to church in a long time or whatever. But they claim that they're Christians. They claim that they believe in the Bible. And really that makes our job a lot easier. We have somewhere to start. Uh, they already have an understanding. They have uh, some faith in the Bible, even though it's been perverted and twisted by false religions and, and public education and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it really is a lot uh, take, a lot of the challenges have been taken taken away. So we got to continue this job. And as I've mentioned uh, in many, many of the messages this month, it seems like our job now is to, unfortunately, we're evangelizing Christians. All right. So like they're not really Christians, but they claim to be Christians. And we're taking them the gospel and taking them the truth in the way that God would have us to do that. Go to... Uh, Go to Acts 8. It'll be a little bit before I get there, but you might have your place there. Ready? Acts chapter 8. So last Thursday, um, we were in Africa as far as talking about the, the continent of Africa. And I talked a little bit about the influence of Africa on the United States, which then leads to 
the history of African, uh, uh, black America and African Americans in the, the history of this nation. And of course, that brings up a whole nother thing. We talked about that on Sunday, evangelizing uh, black America. Uh, but now we're into the America. So we're going to talk primarily about Latin America. Now, maybe you know this, probably, probably you know this. Okay, let me just put a disclaimer real quick. I always put a disclaimer. I'm no expert uh, on these things and wasn't even a good student, didn't listen in my history classes like I should have. Okay, so if I make any mistakes, correct me afterwards, that's fine. <laughs> but as Christians who are trying to reach the world, I've been really convicted that we need to know more about the people groups of this world and have a basic understanding of their, uh, their beliefs, about their history, about their geography. Some of us have no idea, you know, where... <laughs> And I'm embarrassed sometimes when I find out that I've been saying certain things wrong. You know, for the longest time, I was confused, and maybe some of y'all are on this, North America, Central America, South America, I'm getting them all mixed up. A lot of times people don't realize, and this is what always threw me off. I, I always thought of Mexico as Central Ameri America. So I was like, oh, yeah, Central America. And Valerie's always like, no, <laughs> Mexico is actually part of North America. And then we leave out Canada. Canada's huge. How can you miss them? How many of you know anything about Canada's history? All I know is that at one point they, uh, they claim that they uh, burned down the White House or something like that. <laughs> you all know that story? <laughs> Not Canada necessarily, but, uh, but anyway, the history of these places. Don't know. How about the islands? We a lot of times forget about the Caribbean islands when we talk about uh, the Americas. And look, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I, I never really paid attention. We're very ethnocentric. We think about, you know, our, our crowd of people and, uh, and where we are. And that's normal, that's natural, there's nothing inherently evil about that. But as Christians who want to evangelize the world, we have got to think about the other people groups of the world. And I talked about how the, the Apostle Paul was great at that. He had an understanding of all the different people groups. In fact, he said, I speak in tongues uh, more than you all. And he's not, he's not talking about some magical language, uh, gibberish. He's saying, I just speak a lot of languages. He could speak to a lot of different people in their languages. And so uh, I think we should at least try to do something uh, to learn about these cultures. So that's what I enjoy about this month and, and, and dealing uh, with these things. So let me real quickly, uh, in case you don't have this down, uh, North America, we're talking about, you know, obviously the United States, but then we have Canada and we have Mexico and we have some of the, uh, the Caribbean uh, islands as well. Uh, we have, uh, uh, let me see here, Central America. We've got Belize, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala. Some good coffee comes out of some of these places. Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama. <laughs> and so uh, these are the Central American. And then you have South America. Uh, you know, most people know that what they, right off the bat. You can visualize that, uh, that region of the world. And so uh, there's a lot of people represented in, in these uh, countries that we're talking about. So here's the interesting thing and why, where I'm going to try to go with this message. These are literally our neighbors, right? C Canada, that's our neighbor, you know, uh, Mexico, that's our neighbor. I mean, it's, it's, if you want to leave the United States and go anywhere. I remember growing up in, uh, you know, going to Bible colleges and growing up around a strong, strong missions programs. You know, a lot of churches I was in a strong missions programs. And it was almost like people made fun of the missionaries that went to Mexico. Cause it's like, Oh, you just couldn't go to Africa. You couldn't go to like the unreached people groups. And I, you just went to Mexico where it's real easy. <laughs> I don't know. Some of you are looking at me like you've never heard that, so, but Valerie's shaking her head. Yes, because we know in strong missions programs, they like, Hey, you got to go to these unreached people groups and the, in the jungle. I mean, there's obviously a lot of jungle in South America as well, but okay. So that is it. So if, if anyone did go to South America, it was like, no, you need to go to like the, these, these indigenous tribes, you know, the, uh, the Indians in the mountains, you know, that, that wear the skirts and, <laughs> and everything. And, and this was like, this is like the real, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these are the real missionaries, right? And people that went to Mexico, they made fun of them. We well, you know Mexico is one of the largest, Mexico City is one of the largest populated cities uh, in the world and has some of the biggest independent Baptist churches in the world, actually. And, uh, um, and so anyway, my point is this, if you can reach a lot of people. Now, I'm not against someone who says, hey, God called me to 
reach this group of people and no one else is reaching them, go preach, fine. I mean, God told people, he told uh, Philip to leave where he was, right, and to go, and he hooked up with the Ethiopian eunuch and preached the gospel to him. God can lead us to different places. I'm not against that. But, you know, sometimes there's this idea like, uh, you know, no, 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 God's called me to this region. So I'm going to spend like 20 years learning the language, you know, another 20 years building relationships and connections. And maybe we can start a church and maybe another 20 years, you know, maybe we'll see somebody get saved. And you're like that long. Yeah, there are some mission works that their entire life, they don't see anybody come to the Lord or maybe one or two people that come to the Lord. And I realize that sometimes down the road, generations later, that might start something that eventually becomes something big. So I'm not knocking that. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But when you get like a letter, I get calls from missionaries all the time trying to get us to, you know, come present their ministry at the church and hopefully we'll take them on and we'll support their ministry. And a lot of times it's to these like rare, rare groups of people. Uh, you know, I got one not too long ago um, and he was working with another team of missionaries. So he wasn't like, hey, no one's down there but we just want to go start something. He was working with another team that was down there. Uh, I say down there, up there. I think it was like, they weren't Eskimos, but it was like in Canada, in like the far regions of Canada, you know, where there's like nobody. You have to like take planes to get from one village to the next village. And, uh, and they were talking about the population of these cities. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not a lot of people. <laughs> And those people need the gospel. I'm not against taking the, the, the gospel to those people. But wouldn't it make sense where you have like thousands and thousands of people who speak your language, like you would just go there, you know? So, so and Spanish is a relatively easy language to learn. Most How many had to take a, at least a semester of Spanish in, uh, in high school? All right, not so many as, as I thought. <laughs> okay, a handful. Uh, you know, <clears throat> It, 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 it's kind of funny because a lot of other nations in the world, you know, have to take an English class in their uh, in their high schools uh, in the United States because they understand the population of the Hispanic, uh, you know, is 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 growing, and you're, it's going to get to a point where you know you could get a better job if you can speak Spanish because you can you know you can help somebody to know the language, you can interpret or whatever. And, uh, and anyway, so that's, that's another, you know, there's statistics out there where they're projecting like, uh, by year, like 2050, if the, everything grows at the rate that it's growing, you know, how many people will be of this religion, how many people will be this ethnicity. And they've got, if I, if I'm not mistaken, if things went the way that they were going right now, by like 2050, like we'd probably be a Spanish speaking <laughs> country in the United States, uh, be, because, uh, that's just, that's just the way it is. Okay. So, uh, so for a missionary to say, you know what, pretty easy for me to get into Mexico. You know, I'm going to go down there and take the gospel, uh, to there. To me, that makes sense. They're our neighbors. All right. So go to Acts chapter eight and, and, and that, uh, that doesn't even, and I'm talking about the Latin American influence on the United States. So really where we're ultimately going for this whole month really is these nations, we don't even have to go to those nations because they're right here in the United States. Yay, they're right here in Kansas City. All these people groups, you know, uh, large groups of these uh, of these different ethnic ethnicities are represented even right here in Kansas City. Okay, but we do want to look at as a whole um, Latin America. Now, let me explain Latin America. The reason it's Latin is because it's talking about the... Uh, the Romance languages, you know, so you got French. It's only like one country in South America that speaks French, French, I think. But then there's uh, Portuguese, like Brazil speaks Portuguese. Most of them speak Spanish. These are all Romance languages. So they, uh, nobody really speaks Latin anymore, but they call them Latin, uh, Latin America. We typically think of Hispanic America, those who speak Spanish, okay? And so uh, look at Acts chapter 8. Now, Jesus told the apostles to go into the whole world, and uh, it's taken this many chapters, and they're still not really going to the whole world. They're pretty much still staying in Jerusalem. And in chapter 8, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, uh, talking about Stephen, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, So the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, and everyone else is scattered. 
You know, I don't know if the church in Jerusalem kind of stayed underground, you know, hidden a little bit or, or what the deal was. But because of the heavy persecution, this caused them to scatter. Now, who knows what the future holds? Uh, the way things get <laughs> getting so weird. Who knows what's going to happen to to Christians, you know, in the in the next uh, few years or whatever. But uh, here's what I think. I really do think times are going to get rough. We're seeing a very small glimpse of some things, you know, that will lead up to tribulation, uh, where times get a whole lot r- way way worse than they are now. Okay, let's just put it that way. We have it pretty easy right now. And you say, well, why would God allow Christians to go through that? Because I do believe that we're going to go through that before the Lord comes back. Why would he allow us to do that? Because tribulation and persecution has always caused God's people to go out and do a mighty work. And the Bible says that the gospel is going to be taken to the whole world, and then these things are going to happen, right, in reference to the Lord coming back. And so I think that this is going to stir us up as we see persecution. We see people not liking uh, true believers, you know, who are preaching the gospel and trying to convert people to Christianity, true Christianity. Uh, I I think that's going to stir up some persecution, which will get Christians in gear and kick us into action. And uh, who knows how that's going to work, where we're going to have to go, uh, you know, how, who's going to go where, how it's going to be spread. Uh, I don't really know. But in this case, in the early church, that's what happened. They were spread. And here's what it says, uh, uh, verse 4, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preach Christ until now. It says he went down. Samaria, if you look on the map, is actually north. But that's the way that they spoke because Jerusalem, you know, they felt like everything was just downhill, you know, into these other parts or, or whatever. So they went down to Samaria. But the idea is that it was just like the next region to go. And so when, when Christ gave him the, the commandments, remember in Acts 1.8, it says, You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and into Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, so that was a prophecy, and here they are finally going into Samaria, into all these other other regions. Okay, but why did they go to Samaria? Why did Philip go to Samaria? Did he just feel this calling? Did God say, hey, you know, he sent him a vision, you know, hey, come to Samaria. We don't read anything about that. Here's what it seems to me to make the best sense. It was just close. (laughs) It was a place to go, and they went there, and, uh, and they preached. So uh, it's a very easy target to to, uh, to access as far as evangelism goes. <clears throat> the other thing about the Samaritans was they had a lot of commonalities. Like they weren't Jew, they weren't Jews, right? But they believed in the religion. You right. You know, they had Abraham as their father, and they believed a lot of the uh, the biblical records. They just had some doctrine mixed up, right? But isn't that true about Latin America? You know, if 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 we go to Mexico or we go to South America, or whatever, we're gonna f- come across people who believe in. You talking about talking about that guy about the Trinity? The majority of people in uh, in Latin America are Catholics. I'll talk about that in a minute. And guess what the Catholics believe in? They believe in the Trinity, right? They believe in Jesus. They just have a lot of other false doctrines that need to be cleared up and say, hey, the Bible doesn't even say that. That's just what man's passed down and, and, uh, and uh, what you've been told. But they need to be taught the, the, the true gospel. But isn't it true? I mean, isn't it interesting how, uh, you know, that's kind of the same deal with Samaria. I think it's interesting. They, they, they had a basic understanding, you know. And you go back to John 4. Let's just go to John 4 real quick. Samaria always seemed to be quite receptive Look at John chapter 4, starting in verse 38, I mean 39. John 4, 39 starts with the uh, the woman at the well, right? Jesus goes into Samaria, which the Jews, you know, had a lot of prejudice, prejudices against the Samaritans. Uh, but here's Jesus sitting, uh, not only sitting, uh, going to the Samaritans, but he sits down, he's talking to this woman. And, uh, and that was something that they didn't do very much either. And Jesus asked uh, her for some water. And this gets the ball going. She finally realizes that she's talking to the Messiah. And she goes and she tells everybody in that region, all the Samaritans, she begins telling them, uh, about Jesus, you know, this man who told her everything that she's done. And, and also, so, uh, so then here's what it says in verse 39. What I say? Chapter four, verse 39, it says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. 
So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many, there, uh, many more believed because his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So, so the, these people were very receptive, it seems like, these Samaritans, uh, to receiving Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. We got a soul winning church. We knock on a lot of doors. We preach the gospel to a lot of people. How many of y'all would agree with me that the Hispanic population is one of the most receptive to getting saved and, and reach, uh, uh, you know, and, and most of those that we've dealt with speak, speak really good. Eng really, they speak English really well, obviously, or else most of us wouldn't have been able to talk, but they've been super receptive. And we've even, we even have had some people just listen to the gospel on a video presentation and we don't know for sure. We don't know their heart, but they claim to believe everything that was said there. And they prayed and they put their trust in Jesus Christ. You know, what I'm saying is super receptive. You know, they say, hey, we'll, we'll take you at your word and then come back later on. And it's like, hey, we believe, you know. And so uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the influences that we have, uh, the opportunities that we have, I should say, are just really well worth the effort. You know, and like I said, I really feel like God is, is bringing something. He's just been, uh, you know. He's just been bringing people to this church. Of course, when we prayed for laborers, boom, we got laborers to start going out and preaching the gospel. Uh, we had a lot of Spanish-speaking people, and where there was language barrier, we're going in these neighborhoods, and it's like, man, I really got to learn Spanish. Lord, send us some helpers in Spanish. All of a sudden, we started getting soul winners that come in that speak Spanish. And, uh, um, and I feel like the Lord is sending us what we need all right, to be able to reach Kansas City. And Kansas City has a huge uh, Spanish population. Now, not as big as, I, I talked about this on Sunday, uh, not as big as the black population, which is a different subject because there's no, there's really no difference. Black Americans, white Americans, right? We're not talking about, that's why I don't like the phrase African-American. They don't even know anything about Africa. Right? We're just Americans, right? So this is a different, this is a different topic than somebody who, you know, a lot of uh, Hispanic Americans, you know, have some r more recent ties, you know, cause it's only been like the last uh, maybe 40 years that the population uh, of immigrants had just really blown up from uh, uh, from Latin America. And so uh, and so in many ways, when we do knock on a door and somebody is Spanish speaking and they like no habla inglés, uh, a lot of times, you know, you're dealing with somebody who's native born, you know, foreign born. And uh, and, and they're here as strangers. Right. They're here. Uh, like I preached a message on love your neighbors, right? They're here in a foreign place. And it's like, hey, you're pilgrims and you're sojourners in this land. So you ought to know what it feels like. Open up to these strangers and, and be loving to them. And, and, uh, and, and so I have a huge burden for that. And I feel, feel like the Lord's going to, uh, uh, hey, here's what the Bible says. You know, if you, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. Right. If he's if it's not like we're praying for something because we just want it's not like we're praying for a big building or lots of money or anything like that. It's like, God, we just need you to give us the resources to do what you want us to do anyway. <laughs> so why wouldn't he give it to us? And so praise the Lord. That's what he's been doing. We just asked for it. And he's said, all right, I'll give you what you what you need. All right. So praise the Lord for that. Now, Latin America is being reached. OK, make no mistake about it. Uh, they are being reached, or they have been reached historically by cat, uh, Catholicism. I already explained that a little bit. But not only that, one of the biggest uh, influences on Latin America right now is the charismatic uh, movement. Okay, uh, even a lot of Catholic churches, the way I understand it, are charismatic. You know, which you don't see as much in the United States, but uh, but there's a huge uh, uh, charismatic movement, and it makes sense if you think about it. Okay. Again, I'm not an expert at this, so you know you can correct me if I'm wrong. But okay, I, we talked about the African population and how if you go back to the indigenous beliefs, the traditional beliefs of the Africans, it was very easy. And we used a word. Now I preached this message in in uh, Iola, but I think I mentioned it here too. Syncretism. Okay, what syncretism is is when you embrace a religion, right? But you just kind of incorporate it into what you already believe. You know, so you just kind of these, the religions just kind of mix. You just add that to your belief. I'm talking, inviting this lady that I worked with uh, who was uh, Chinese, 
this was in uh, in Springfield, Missouri, I think. And she was Chinese, and I invited her to church, and I was trying to preach the gospel and everything. She's like, oh, I'm a Christian. But she had a little Buddha thing on her neck, you know, and, I, and she's Chinese. So I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, th I thought you were you're a Buddhist. She's like, oh, I'm Buddhist too. But I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm Christian as well. Like, I, I think they're compatible. And I'm like, no, they're not <laughs> compatible. But this is the way a lot of people think. Like, okay, I can just, if you're, if you're, roots are in like a polytheist religion and you know animist religion where there's spirits and all this kind of stuff it it doesn't even cross your mind that that's weird that you would mix a religion with your religion right because that's just they believe in lots of religions anyway and most of it's been passed down by oral tradition and everything not really a big deal for us if you've been raised with christian principles and everything you probably already know no i can't accept other beliefs. There's only one God. And he said, if you don't receive Jesus Christ and you don't have the father. And, uh, and so like, it's, it's very, you know, uh, uh, exclusive in that way. Inclusive. I always say about the gospel inclusive in that anybody who can, can get saved, whosoever may come. Right. But it's exclusive that there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the father, but by me. So we have to preach Jesus Christ. And if someone says, oh, yeah, I'll just add them to my belief. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, which means you need to stop trusting your works, stop trusting your false beliefs and your false religions, and put uh, your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when we, uh, talk about, when we talked about Africa, that's what a lot of Africans did, and that's why charismatic movement is thriving in Africa, because it's real easy to mix their animistic beliefs and their spirit spiritism beliefs with the charismatic movement. Well, Latin America is not that much different, right? I mean, it goes way back, but, you know, there were a lot of spiritual type uh, uh, beliefs that they had uh, in there, especially among the, the Indian tribes, okay? Now, the, the state of, I'm way off, like, uh, who knows where this sermon's gonna go, okay? <laughs> the state of Latin America now might be a little different than you think. All right. It's funny because if you go to other parts of the world, like, you know, when we went to Japan, uh, I was when I was a little kid, I had blonde hair. Right. And every Japanese and blue eyes. And so I mean, I still have blue eyes, but every Japanese person wanted to touch my hair. And that's weird. Let me touch your hair. You're like, why do you want to touch my hair? <laughs> but that's just, that's just what they did because there wasn't that many white people around. And they're just like, wow, can I get your picture? We, well, I was like a celebrity. <laughs> and so uh, when we went off base, you know, on the military base, we all looked the same. <laughs> and so uh, actually it was pretty diverse. Uh, so uh, the state of, <laughs> where am I going with this? The state of uh, Latin America, though, is it is intermingled, right? You couldn't tell, uh, you know, a lot of times you can't tell, is this person white? Is this person, you know, uh, Native American? You know, it, it's just, they, they're just so intermingled. Way more than the United States was when it was colonized and everything. It seemed like they kept a little bit more separate. There was a lot of intermingling. We all, how many of you got Indian in you, right? Some Native American blood in you somewhere, Black, Blackfoot, Cherokee, you know, everybody's got some in them. So, Obviously, there's some intermingling, but in Latin America, it's a lot. What is that? What's that called, Valerie? The the, I guess race or whatever, huh? Mestizo, mestizo. Does that sound right? Anybody know that? Familiar with that word? That's like it's funny because she just used that word earlier, and I was like, hey, I was reading about that. That is the number one, like, uh, gr uh, uh, I don't know if race is the right word, but you know, like if you break down the the United States by race. It's going to be white, it's going to be Hispanic, and then it's going to be black, and then it's going to be Asian. If you break down the race in Latin America, again, I'm not an expert in this. I'm just trying to bring back everything I studied to my mind. It's mestizo, or however you pronounce that word, which is just a, a mixture. Like, you can't really tell the difference. And then the next is white, right? And then I guess it would be black, or, or maybe Native American, then black. But what I'm saying is like, for the most part, like there's no, it's like, are you white? Are you, you know, it's not, it's, it's not as, as diverse. Okay. So now in the United States, close to, I would say 20%, close to 20% of the population of the United States is now Hispanic. Okay. So that's over 60 million and 20% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but 
but it is. Like I said, that's, that's a higher population. I might be off on that a uh, little bit, but that's a higher population than black America, you know, or, or African Americans, or I think they usually intermingle those two, African American and black American. Uh, but the Latin population is even higher than that, you know, in the United States. So what I want to talk about here for the rest of the message, and hopefully I won't take too long on this, but uh, is basically just some ideas, uh, just some thoughts as to how Latin America has influenced the United States. Because it's a great thing. we got to remember this about the United States. Uh, we're, we are just a mixture of all different cultures of the world, and it's really cool. Like we have a few things that have just come like that's, you know, I don't know, maybe baseball and hot dogs, <laughs> you know, I don't know, that, that are like thought of as like these are things that are, you, and probably not. You probably could trace those back to something because we all just came here from different, you know, uh, you know, our ancestors came from different, different places. Okay, so how, and so we talked about how black, uh, how Africa had, has influenced uh, the United States. Now let's talk about some areas where Latin America has influenced uh, our culture. Well, number one, We'd be remiss not to mention food. I mean, come on. Who doesn't like Mexican food <laughs> and Latin American food, right? Uh, another thing, and this is, by the way, this list is just when I, I was just looking up, doing some research. These are the actual things that they said, that, that some of the sources that I read said, like, these are the ways Latin America has uh, influenced uh, our culture. Sports, okay? Sometimes you might not think that. But I mentioned baseball when I said, like, that's the United States. Hey, baseball has got a huge uh, Latin American influence, you know, and, you know, they talk about the Cubans, uh, but then there's also, you know, uh, all different part, parts of Latin America. Um, and now I'm particularly interested in running, right? Like long distance, like ultra marathon running. And uh, when I started reading about that and studying these things, I studied about this one, uh, I don't want to get too far from this because it's not important, but <laughs> I studied about this one race that is run in the desert. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's 130 miles in the desert. Starts in, it's called Bad, the Badwater uh, Ultra Marathon. It starts in, the, in the, the lowest point, which is in Death Valley, and it ends in the highest point, which is on Mount Whitney, okay? And I was watching this documentary on that, and the guy that won, like every year, was this Mexican guy. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Like, what is this, you know, what, is there something like genetically about that? You know, they talk about the marathoners, it's always the Kenyans, right? The Kenyans always win all these races. Well, what is about the ultra marathon? And then, lo and behold, I'm studying all these different, uh, uh, you know, over, over the years, studying about ultra marathons. And somebody came out with a book called Born to Run. And, uh, and they, this, this, these people, they went and they studied this tribe called the Tamarahara Indians or the Ramari Indians, or I might be mixing, I'm not saying that right, but they're like in the Chiapas Mountains. And uh, in this culture, like they run up and down hill, uh, uh, up and down mountains all the time. And they play games where like sometimes those games be marathon or maybe even a hundred miles where they're just, where they're playing this game. It's kind of like what we would call soccer, but they're like kicking this little ball up the mountain or something like that. And I remember watching that and they study these guys and how they ran and all this. And they were like super healthy. Now the weird thing is like they all smoked and drank alcohol like crazy, but they were super healthy. <laughs> so like, I'm not trying to like, uh, stay away from those things. But it was really weird. Like what was so healthy about these people? And, and I don't know, like I could think about a few things like, uh, and, it, and it, truly, if you look it up, their li uh, the life expectancy of, of a Latin American. Now, this is just the little research that I did. Okay. But the life expectancy is like 88 years old or something like that, which is higher than, you know, every other, every other race uh, that's represented. Okay. And all I can think of, like maybe, Maybe they're just because you think about how active, like hardworking, you know, a lot of uh, people are from Latin America. And, and uh, you know, I would say this. I would say this exception. You know, don't quote me on it, but I think I'm pretty, pretty true here. The ones who were born in Latin America and have come here or maybe they're just like a second generation. Right. They're usually hard workers. But there are some who've been raised here, and it's kind of like what happened with the Native Americans. They just got to a point where the government's given them a lot of things, and they they haven't been forced to work like their like their uh, like their ancestors did, and their or their parents and grandparents and all that stuff. 
And so maybe some of those, if you look, start looking on the poverty scale and all that kind of stuff, welfare and all that stuff, a lot of those fit in that category. But, um, but as a whole, it seems like, man, a lot of hard workers, uh, maybe their maybe they're diet, but I don't know. I mean, I eat Mexican food and it doesn't help me run. Any- <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know, a lot of corn. Maybe you need more corn in your, in your diet. Maybe, I think this could be it. They take siestas. I mean, come on. We need to take more siestas. <laughs> All right, we got to move on. How have they influenced uh, a lot of people? We'll talk about music. Now, I'll say this. I, in my personal opinion, okay, I don't know if I would just call it, or even Cuban music or Mexican music, or I don't know I don't know where the boundaries are, okay? That's how, that's how little I know. I think it's an acquired taste. <laughs> when we were in Oklahoma City, we were in the ghetto, all right? Uh, I told you a little bit about that last week. Uh, we were in the ghetto. We were in like some really low income neighborhoods, a lot of gangs, drugs, and stuff like that. And so, you know, you got all the rap music going on. I remember one time I knocked on this door and the little kids, they'd been coming to our church for a long time and they looked at me and said, I just heard you were listening to Snoop Dogg in your car. And I was like, I have never listened to Snoop Dogg in my life. My radio doesn't even work. (laughs) And they're like, I heard it when you shut off the car, it stopped. And I was like, that's got to be your neighbors. It's just a coincidence. All right. But anyway, a lot of rap music and all that kind of stuff going on. But what killed me in Oklahoma City was the Mexican gangs. (laughs) Because they'd be driving in the car, right? And they got the bandanas on and they're all this like, I mean, the Mexican music is, it's an acquired taste. Now, if I'm eating at a Mexican restaurant, I love the music. Okay. But, (laughs) but, uh, but it has, uh, influenced, uh, (laughs) the music in some way, uh, throughout history in the United States dancing. I don't know. There's a lot of Spanish style dancing and uh, I guess that would be Spain, but, uh, still, uh, these are just things, like I said, that, that just kind of came up in my study. Now, here's an interesting one. Beauty standards. Now, this is interesting, okay? What, what the United States thought about maybe 50 years as like, hey, this is what a beautiful woman looks like, or, or man, but come on, we usually, when we talk about beauty in the United States, we're talking about women. It has changed over the years. And now, you know, I, it seems like when people are talking about how beautiful a woman is or something, a lot of times they have a Latin American influence to them. And so with all the, again, inter uh, racial uh, you know mixed relationships and stuff like that our culture is becoming more and more uh, mixed like you know what I'm saying so different features are going to uh, change over time how about uh one of the biggest influences on our culture in the United States and I don't like this but it's true is television right Hollywood and all that well this is interesting uh, when I was a kid I don't like to admit this. My, my, my wife hates this show, but when I was a kid, I watched Sesame Street. Anybody watch Sesame Street when they were a kid? And what I found out in Sesame Street, as I started growing up, I was like, man, you can learn some Spanish by watching Sesame Street. <laughs> they're starting to teach Spanish and all that stuff. And then I got a little bit older, had kids. Dora the Explorer, she's teaching these kids how to speak Spanish, <laughs> right? And so uh, if you watch TV growing up, you see that the... The, la- the the Hispanic uh, influence on television. And if I understand right, Univision is a Spanish Spanish channel or whatever, is like way up there in ratings. It's one of the higher uh, higher stations. It has a lot of uh, a lot of listeners. So anyway, we're, we, you, 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 there's a lot of this. Uh, every business call that you make on the phone says, press one if you want to speak Spanish, right? One of these days, my goal is to speak Spanish well enough to always push one and listen to it. <laughs> All right. Uh, How about politics? Oh, by the way, about the TV, you know, I looked up the highest paid TV actress. I didn't look up the highest paid Latin American TV actress. I looked up the highest paid TV actress. Well, I think right now it's uh, it's, uh, Johansson or whatever her name is. Uh, But that's that's a different for TV actress, at least. It was uh, somebody who's Latin, who, who's uh, Latin, Latin American, Sofia Vergar, Vergardi. I don't even know who she is. I had to look up and I was like, oh, I think I've seen her before. But Vergarda, who knows who I'm talking about? You do? You bunch of heathens. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Politics. Don't let AOC be a representative. <laughs> 
uh, I don't even know where she's from, but politics. You know, I don't know uh, how much uh, Latin America is represented in politics as far as like actual you know, leaders. Uh, that would be an interesting study. I actually didn't look into that much. But when I think of politics and how how, how Latin America has affected our politics, it mostly has to do in pol with policies. But here's even another twist to this whole thing. Uh, if you are a Republican or you know a lot of Republicans, Latin America has not had a great uh, relationship with Republicans, right? It's just not. It, and, if, and, and I don't think that Republicans as a whole, and I don't claim to be a Republican, but I, I, think, I don't think Republicans as a whole like are prejudiced and don't like Latin Americans, but their policies and what they stand for and, and all the liberals, you know, talk about how, you know, they're building the walls and they're doing all this kind of stuff and they don't want anybody to migrate. You know, that's created a lot of tension. Leave it to the media to always build up a lot of tension, but in politics and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's just something that has become part of our culture. There's a lot of uh, uh, policies and stuff made in regards to Latin America. All right, but most importantly uh, to us, the religion, okay? Now, I don't know how much I can say like Latin America has contributed to the religion in the United States, uh, but here's what I can say about the breakdown of Latin America. 50% are Catholic. Okay. And that's, that's pretty huge. 50% of the, of the Latin American pop, population is uh, Catholic. 20% is evangelical or, or traditional, uh, whatever it's called Protestant. 20% is unaffiliated. Okay. So you, we don't know exactly what they are. Now, only 1% of Latin Americans claim that there's no God, like by the statistics, Pew Research or whatever. Only one, less than 1% say that there's no God, right? I would say the majority of them say, well, yes, I believe the Bible, I'm Catholic, or yes, I believe the Bible, I'm this or that. And so they believe in God, they believe in the Bible, they believe in Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, and that, interestingly, is the same number, and I talked about black America, Black America and how the, how religious they are, how many of them go to church, whatever. Uh, again, less than one percent claim not to believe in God. Now, with with white people, it's more like three percent, something like that. It's it's it, I don't know what it is, like education or whatever. Um, funny, they got a saying in Latin America that's like uh, 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 something like this, like money money makes people white. <laughs> Like the more money they get, the the wider they get, you know. And so, uh, uh, it's interesting. But money and education and all that stuff seems to turn people away from God. Look at the neighborhoods we go into that are the most unreceptive. They're the ones who you know have the big houses and the nice jobs, and they're like, look, I, I'm good. I don't have any time for that. And uh, and so maybe that's that maybe that's part of it. But here's the crisis. Okay. Uh, well, the number one crisis, and that's what I'll end with, is just simply the 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 fact that so many are not saved. So many will go to hell because they don't know the true gospel. Uh, but here's what that leads to. You say, oh, only 1%, you know, claims to believe, uh, claim, uh, doesn't believe in God. So that means all the rest of them, you know, believe in God. 50% of those Catholic, 40% or, or I mean, 20% uh, Protestant. You know, that's a lot of people who are Christians. So you say, man, they must be like some of the most like, uh, you know, godly, just holy people in the United States. And the truth is that they're not. Now, you might be surprised. I was when I started looking into um, uh, the breakdown of like poverty and the breakdown of like prisons and fatherless children and, and, uh, and all that stuff. And really, here, here, here's, here's what you come up with, okay? And this isn't me by any means being like, you know, racist or putting down another person. This is just facts. Okay. You can look this up government sites. Nobody's trying to hide this. Okay. The real crisis, as far as just in the United States, from a moral standpoint, uh, you know, living, living good, what we would consider a good life. Uh, the biggest crisis is with black America, right? By far, by far. If you're going to look up, if you're going to research any of these things, how many are in prison percentage, you know, population that's in prison, the population that's in poverty, the population that has, uh, uh, you know, fatherless children, 
by far the percentage of blacks is is way higher. Now, don't get me wrong, it's only like 50%. So a person is, is, is really dumb or uneducated if they just look at every black person and say, or if they do like Biden and say, you know, whites and poor people, <laughs> right? That's, that's dumb, okay? Because it's only like, we're only talking like 50% of the race, but that's still a huge population, you know, that, that are living in, in really bad situations. Next under that, which is a lot, which is a little bit smaller people group, but uh, but way just in a cri- in state of crisis is Native Americans. Okay, and I didn't even touch on Native Americans in this, uh, you know, because well, we only have one week to do each continent, you know what I mean? So I didn't deal with them, and we didn't even touch on Canada or anything. I could preach a sermon on Canada, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but Native Americans, and this is why we have a lot of missionaries and folks who have given a lot of time to uh, the reservations and stuff like that, because I'm telling you, it's a state of crisis. You know, a lot of them in poverty, a lot of them in and out of jail, a lot of them drunk, you know, in the casinos all the time. And like, this is their whole lifestyle. And it's terrible. It's terrible. And so they're, you know, their only hope is Christ, you know, and I know we don't, we don't, we know that they can be saved and still be still be living in sin. Okay. We, we, uh, I think everybody in here agrees that we can all, uh, fall into the flesh and live in sin, even if we're born again, Christians, but only through Christ can we get ourselves out of these lifestyles. You know what I mean? So, so somebody who has Christ has hope that says, Hey, through the help of the Lord, I can get through these obstacles. I can get out of this uh, this stigmatism that that just says that hey I'm gonna you know everyone's I don't have hope I can't get an education you know I can't get uh you know I can never have a happy marriage or anything like that that's that is not true if you have God on your side it doesn't matter what the statistics say first of all uh, and so uh, so anyway but you got Black America then you have Native Americans. And then the third one, and it's a lot closer to whites than you might think, would be uh, the Hispanic culture. But they do have, don't get me wrong, there is a class uh, that is that is in a crisis state. Uh, but again, you know, Brother Justin, I think we're talking about this last week, how in certain neighborhoods and certain cultures within the culture, like, you know, for instance, the hip hop culture, you know, you can't just label blacks and say hip hop culture because there are whites that are in that, there are, are you know, Hispanics that are in that hip hop culture and that whole culture of just, you know, sex and drugs and, and, uh, and, and violence and, and, and all this gang banging stuff, or whatever, that's just a wicked culture. And it's just, and that is what's, you know, that's what needs to be fought against. It's not color. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not blacks versus the cops and all that, you know, this weird stuff that the media tries to paint it. It's a, number one, they need Christ. Okay. Number two, we need to just get rid of some of these bad influences on our culture and stop promoting it. And like all the songs, like they just playing all these songs on the air. It's just vile. I mean, I don't listen to any, I don't listen to any, you know, other than just the stuff you hear in the stores or you maybe just happen to be hearing something. I watch a YouTube video or something and there's music playing in the background. For the most part, I don't go around listening to secular music. Okay. I just don't, but you can go into a store you know, or, or, I mean, just, man, some of you work in places where they play songs and you're like, Hey, this is a, I'm at work, right? This is a public place. I'm at work, business professional. And this song's got profanity and it's talking about sexual things and all this kind of stuff. And like, that's an awful culture. United States doesn't need that at all. All right. And as Christians, we should fight against that. We should preach hard against that lifestyle. It's destroying a lot of people. I know good Christian men who are destroyed in that culture and it's like they can't live for the Lord because they're they're so held back by that by that wicked lifestyle. All right, got that off my chest. Now, uh, let me just close by saying this. I think I'm out of time. I'm thankful for the influence of Latin America on the United States. I'm thank, I, I mentioned last week. I'm thankful for the African influences on the United States. Now, every inf, you know, everybody can bring some bad influences to the table. Don't get me wrong. Any 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 uh, lifestyle or cultural thing that was be anti Bible, we don't want. We want to stay away from that for sure. But there's a lot of cultural things that makes the United States beautiful. You know, and I I love these cultural uh, influences. I'm thankful that, you know, we as soul winners, you know, with a mind for worldwide evangelism. 
We don't really have to go travel all over the world, right? We don't even have to leave Kansas City, like I said, to be able to, to minister and to see people saved from all these different people groups. You know, who knows how the Lord can use that? Obviously, I'm not against going to other parts of the world. But in an ideal world, I would think that, you know, these you can reach somebody who, uh, you know, is, who's got family maybe in Mexico and they're here in the United States for whatever reason. And now they get saved and they know the gospel and they get discipled and they learn how to do They could reach out to their family. And, you know, that's how the whole world gets reached. You just go preach the gospel to everybody you're able to and, uh, and let the Lord lead you to the right places. You don't need to spend your entire life focusing on this one little place where nothing's, nothing's happening. You know what I mean? What we just need to do is be sensitive to, uh, to God's leadership, yes, but just preach the gospel to everybody that we have opportunity to. So that's what uh, I think it would be good for us to learn how to most effectively reach all these different people groups. And I'm thankful that traveling too, you know, if we wanted to go on a missions trip that was out of the United States, which I would love to do one, one day soon, you know, fairly soon, we could go to the Caribbean islands. We could go to Mexico. We could go, I've got connections in these places, you know, somewhat. And, uh, and there's places we could go and see, you know, another culture and be able to give the gospel to them and everything. And, and it's, it's wide open. Some of those Caribbean islands, you know, uh, you could go there and go into the public schools and preach the gospel and just talk to people on the streets. Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to kick you out. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's wide open. And I'm thankful that for the most part, it's been my experience that uh, Hispanics and those from that, uh, you know, Latin America are very receptive to the gospel. It's been my, um, yeah, it's been, I think, our testimony here in Kansas City as we go out. A lot of the, the folks with the Latin American background, very receptive to the gospel. And they understand that what, they're, what they've been taught is wrong. You know, and they see the Bible and they say, hey, I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, I, I, I've been taught wrong about praying to the saints and praying to Mary and the idols and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and we have an opportunity here to, to get involved in this and to reach that culture. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, different kind of message uh, this whole month. Lord, just going to be weird like this. But, uh, but Lord, I, I truly feel like um, this is what we need this month. And, and we need a time of the year to just get it set, set aside and realize uh, there's so many different cultures, uh, even right here in our own neighborhood, and so many different uh, beliefs and, and, and practices and traditions that people have. And, and help us just not necessarily embrace all those things, but help us to learn and to be appreciative of, of what we can and, and uh, to be educated and to be able to use that education not like the world uses education to turn from you, but to use the education to be productive and, uh, and to reach more for you and bear more fruit for your name and for your honor and glory. I pray you bless now and, uh, and, and uh, keep everybody safe tonight. And uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.